Well, I see that she got the speech that my mother prepared, so I'm really, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for that. So it's really wonderful being back here. I, we have so many close friends and colleagues here in Australia, and wonderful to be partnering with the uh, the NPN Alliance here in Australia uh, for for really this this unique and first kind of large patient meeting. You know, this is a very unique community. NPN patients really have a level of interconnectedness, you know, both within their countries and around the world that is very unique, you know, and provides tremendous community, not only for yourselves, but truly acts as, you know, a strong stimulus for additional research, for really bringing your, your viewpoints and important perspectives regarding, you know, what you feel are the unmet challenges you have with your disease. You know, and the voice of you as the MPN community really has been very impactful, not only how we evaluate new therapies, but also identifying unmet needs. So I was going to focus my talk today and try to complement some of the wonderful talks you've already heard and some of them yet to come regarding new therapies, how they relate to myelofibrosis, as well as some non-pharmacologic interventions that are being investigated. Now, any medicine we discuss today really potentially has relevance across everyone that has an MPN. We typically do start with evaluating many medicines in myelofibrosis first, in part because frequently that's the area of greatest unmet need, and we want to get a good sense of the safety and effectiveness of a medicine before we would end up testing it then in individuals with ET or polycythemia vera. Now, people sometimes ask, how does one get into a field like this? As, you, as, as you'll see from my very stylish outfit in the early 1980s, this is the St. Peter's Science Fair. And indeed, this is my project on diseases of the blood, on leukemias. Uh, amazingly, in this, in this handwritten in pencil paper, which my mother kept as my first paper, there is hydroxyurea listed there as, as therapy for, for CML. I will shamelessly point out the blue ribbon, you know, just, 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 just to portend of things to come. <laughs> so now I currently work at the Mayo Clinic. The Mayo Clinic has three sites in the United States, uh, a, a large place. Uh, those that behave well are able to be in the Arizona campus. It's a beautiful spot in the desert. It's uh, lovely winters. This is our new cancer center. I'm the director of the cancer center. We celebrate the opening this past year. Now, with MPNs, clearly as you look around the room, this is a very heterogeneous group of diseases. People can be young. They can be older. Some people can be very ill. Some people you would not know they were ill unless they told you. And that sometimes can be its own challenge. Now, one key thing we have tried to identify is personalized medicine. Now, in medicine now, there's a lot of discussion of personalized medicine, meaning we try to understand an individual based on the mutation that a disease has. And that's helpful, that is part, but clearly the other parts of individualized medicine is really understanding the individual, the rest of their health, their beliefs, their goals, as all of these things contribute to coming up with a treatment plan that is correct for one individual. Now with MPNs, as I think about Dr. Michaels or Ram Paul or Dr. Ross, myself, Dr. Lane, we're thinking about many different things. We're thinking about risk of vascular events. We're thinking about are there cytopenias and what do they tell us about the disease? We are very mindful of progression. And as we'll discuss later, that's a key concern for many of you. We are mindful of the spleen and its enlargement and the symptoms it can give. We've done a lot of research really in collaboration directly with patients, better understanding the symptoms patients have. And then finally, we need to be very mindful of the rest of your health in that an MPN is not an entity unto itself, it's just one aspect of your health, and we need to be very mindful of your whole health and how an MPN might impact the rest of your health, but also how the rest of your health might impact the MPN. Now, I have the honor of chairing a panel for the United States that is setting the guidelines in terms of treatment. These are the NCCN guidelines. And whether we have many, including Dr. Ron Paul, 
uh, all the key MPN doctors in the United States contributing to this. And this is helpful in the United States in a variety of ways. It helps to set standard. We hope it helps to improve quality by decreasing, let's say, variability in terms of how patients are managed. It also has relevance in terms of how our insurance companies or our government payers reimburse for care for MPN patients. Now, we came out with the first set of these guidelines, which included diagnosis and treatment response, as well as planning in MF, PV, and ET. The first set of guidelines had the treatment guidelines for myelofibrosis, and soon we will be publishing the guidelines in PVERA and ET. Now, in myelofibrosis, for the first time, we put very clearly that we view that the assessment of symptoms is a key part in terms of determining therapy for an individual. It's clearly not the only thing we consider, but in the past it was not considered at all. So it needs to be a key part. Individuals with low risk myelofibrosis can range from people that don't know they're ill to people that can have significant symptoms because the symptoms have not necessarily been associated with living a shorter amount of time. With this, we stratify our treatment discussion based on symptoms. Patients that do not have symptoms, it is reasonable potentially to watch the disease. And I am mindful how distressing it sometimes can be to be told you have a disease and we're not doing anything. And that is a distress and one that we have to deal with in and itself. Patients that have symptoms, we can consider therapy. Now it depends on how problematic are the symptoms and what is the benefit or risk of taking a medication. But therapies that have been considered include ruxolitinib. Dr. Rampal gave a lovely discussion on interferons or clinical trials. Patients with intermediate one risk myelofibrosis have perhaps the most varied experience. Individuals might be intermediate one and truly have a much higher risk than others that are intermediate one. So increasingly, as your doctors are looking at a variety of different parameters, they are looking at other molecular features, the symptoms of your disease, to try to decide how best do we manage patients who have intermediate one risk myelofibrosis. Those with intermediate two and high risk myelofibrosis actually represent the majority of patients with myelofibrosis. Here, the key first decision is a difficult one. Do we consider a stem cell transplant or do we consider a medicine as a treatment? Bone marrow transplant can cure myelofibrosis, but it is fair to say it's probably one of the most complicated medical therapies an individual can undergo and carries with it a significant risk. And understanding that option, that risk, and whether it is an appropriate time for an individual is a very, very complex decision. And anyone that says that it's not complex is a person that's not had to make that decision themselves. So we decide that difficult issue up front. Do we consider transplant now? Do we consider transplant at some point in the future? And if so, what would that, what would change to make that transplant really uh, go forward? Or is it really not an appropriate option? Patients who are not going to transplant, we stratify folks based on their blood counts. And currently, the one approved medicine in Australia and the US, which is that of ruxolitinib, with particular benefit for enlarged spleen, difficult symptoms, and likely has an impact on the uh, survival with the disease. Now, when you only have one therapy, clearly the question becomes, well, if I'm on that therapy, have I failed the therapy? Now, it's always difficult when we have one therapy to define what does failing that therapy mean? Because in, in our eyes as hematologists, it always comes down to, well, what is our alternative? You heard about some of the medicines and clinical trials from Dr. Ron Paul. And again, as hematologists, we try to assess. Is someone having no benefit, no reduction in the spleen, no symptoms and toxicity, clearly does not make a lot of sense to remain on the therapy. Or more frequently, is there some mixed pattern of some benefit, perhaps some toxicity, and that decision regarding do we continue on this or do we try an alternative therapy? Now, one alternative therapy that is trying to uh, become an approved option is an alternative JAK inhibitor that Dr. Rampal briefly mentioned, which is pacritinib. 
There was a study just published at the American Society of Hematology looking at this JAK inhibitor that could be used in individuals that have low platelet counts. So let's say a select group of patients with myelofibrosis with quite advanced disease. It was presented at ASH that this medicine could be given safely. Uh, it could be given with effect in improving symptoms and spleen uh, and probably was better than the uh, alternative options for folks, which tended to be either very small doses of ruxolitinib or pacritinib given in a bigger dose once a day. This agent helped to improve individual symptoms and again, we saw a difference in giving this medicine twice a day versus once a day, as well as asking patients their overall impression of change. So as we are considering new therapies, we are considering many different things. One, how helpful is it? Two, what are the side effects or expense, if you would, of taking the medicine? And three, how should we give the medicine? It's not always as easy as it sounds. Is it once a day? Is it twice a day? Is it once once day and twice the next day? Because these can have significant implications in terms of both effectiveness and response. The second drug actually was developed here in Australia, mamalitinib, from a company called Cytopia, and they've sold it a couple times since. But there were two large phase three studies that demonstrated this drug has some benefits. It's a JAK inhibitor. It can improve the spleen and symptoms, might have an impact on anemia. The results of the trials were mixed. They were not quite what they had anticipated and is probably not going to be developed further, at least at the moment. People have tried a whole range of different combinations. Ruxolitinib is approved. Let's try a whole different range of options with it. And all of these, as you might expect, do have the benefit that ruxolitinib has. They improve spleen. They improve symptoms. However, we've not yet found a combination that clearly raises the bar further in terms of response, namely to dramatically improve either the platelet count, hemoglobin, or fibrosis. So at the current time, combinations remain interesting, but there is no combination that really has evolved to become a standard of care. Now, there are new drugs in development, many early in development, but these are trials that are further along. One is an antifibrosing drug called PRM-151. The idea being if you decrease some of the fibrosis, will the bone marrow work better? Can you make myelofibrosis behave more like P. vera or ET? That would be a benefit. That trial is accrued and we await the information. The second a agent that's a telomerase inhibitor, this is a medicine called a metalstat. It's quite a powerful drug, probably initially developed more as a drug for acute myeloid leukemia, so a, a bit stronger drug. Uh, it's currently in clinical trials with at least a subset of patients with MF having a good response. But again, like most of these studies, we need to learn more about its safety, its effectiveness, and which patients specifically are benefiting. This is currently ongoing in a clinical trial. There's an alternative group of drugs trying to look at improving anemia. Anemia can be a difficult part of myelofibrosis, and frequently, even if we've seen reduction in splenomegaly or symptoms, there can be residual uh, anemia. This agent, tested by our colleagues at MD Anderson, showed improvement in anemia. Here's an individual who uh, got off of needing transfusions with a good improvement in their hemoglobin, and there's a parallel compound to this one called Lespatercept that will be opening in a clinical trial in the near future. So if we think about where these therapies might position themselves in myelofibrosis, one, any drug that is approved for myelofibrosis now potentially is a consideration for people that have failed ruxolitinib because it's a different drug. People might fail for a, a range of reasons. Uh, any of these drugs clearly might be used in the second line setting. If pacritinib were approved, it may well have a role as the initial therapy in a subset of people with myelofibrosis that have very low platelet counts. Now I wanted to focus the second part of my talk really on sharing some of the information that we have really learned that you as patients have taught us. Indeed, it was a patient of mine who was a, a very impactful many years ago, Joyce Niblack, who really helped to start a lot of this effort by pushing us to really question 
aspects of this disease, to think of MPNs not like necessarily another cancer, but as their own entity with a very different natural history and different way that they might burden individuals. Now one, these are diseases that cause symptoms. And these symptoms are not in your head. They are direct biological effect of the disease. Just like if you have strep throat and you have a fever, if you have symptoms from an MPN, there is biology behind it. If you have itching, we know that the white cells have migrated to the skin and can be a source of that. If you have fever, there are cytokines from the marrow that are produced in the liver that can increase uh, the temperature threshold. If you have weight loss, there is reason for this. So these things are not in your head. These are genuine, and they are a sign of the disease. And we not only want to improve them, but we want to learn what do they tell us about the disease. Our group has been very active trying to develop standardized ways that we can ask about these symptoms so we can compare patients uh, serially as we give them a treatment, as we can compare patients in different populations. We have data in almost 6,000 patients from 40 different countries in 18 different languages. And what I can tell you is that someone from Cairns has a fairly similar experience to someone in Uruguay, Singapore, or in Canada. It is remarkable the degree of similarity, in particular of the ranking of symptoms by disease for these symptoms across the world. Now these symptoms are one, they are common. Two, as surprises many of my colleagues as hematologists, they clearly can be present in ET and P. vera. Many people think that symptoms are only for patients with myelofibrosis. It is true patients with myelofibrosis in general are more symptomatic, and there's a few symptoms that I would link more with myelofibrosis, in particular, inadvertent weight loss. Uh, there are certain others, such as itching, that are more common in polycythemia vera. Now, people have asked me and pushed back and say, you know, you tell me your patients have a lot of symptoms, Ruben, but you know what? I do too. You know, I'm tired. I'm having to take my kids to ballet and to soccer and to this and that. I'm tired. You know, I have P. vera patients. You know, the patient in the next room has, you know, advanced liver cancer. You know, my, my MPN patient looks fine. You, you know, they're just complaining. So, so we did a study with our colleagues in Ireland to try to demonstrate compared to the general population, uh, as, as good a match as Dubliners are for the general population, but, <laughs> but regardless, that we were able to demonstrate that with each individual symptom in a case-controlled way, there was a clear difference. There's additionally efforts here in Australia with Lynn Fritchie uh, and others developing a prospective assessment of patients with MPNs in Australia that will help us to, to uh, learn more about these populations. Now, people sometimes throw the concept of quality of life and symptoms as an interchangeable concept. And I would say that that is not the case. Symptoms are an important part of the disease. Symptoms can clearly impact your quality of life, but quality of life is a different concept. When your overall quality of life has many contributors, you might be perfectly healthy and you, know, you have a terrible family event, your spouse dies, your quality of life is terrible, but that has nothing to do with your health. Now, health-related quality of life clearly has many contributors. Disease symptoms are clearly part Next, if you're taking a medication, toxicities from that clearly can be a negative. There can be impact from prior MPN complications. There's the stressor of having the disease, uncertainty. There are the comorbidities, and there is the hassle of medical care. So all of these things clearly can impact in terms of an individual's health-related quality of life. Now, people have asked me, well, what, how symptomatic is symptomatic for me to start someone on a treatment? I don't really think there's an easy way to answer that because it's obviously a personal choice. Some individuals, and only you can really answer, is a symptom difficult enough that you really want to try something for relief? That's always balanced against, well, if I take that, what are the side effects going to be? Uh, and what is the, the difficulty in taking the medicine? What we can say is we analyze the significant data from all these patients is that if we look at single item scores from zero to 10 that are over five out of 10, that is an outlier and those are pretty symptomatic individuals. Likewise, out of a 100 point scale, nobody 
ever fills these things out in circles 10 for everything. It just, just doesn't happen. Being over 20 actually is a clear outlier. The same is true in patients with ET and P. vera, and we can correlate that individuals that have more of those symptoms do have a variety of matching biological features, whether it's different vascular events, changes in blood counts, white cell changes that are clearly linked. The symptoms are just another biological marker of the disease. Now people have supposed that symptoms are only linked to risk. There's a lot of discussion of risk in MPNs. Risk and symptoms have a relationship, but they are not really one-to-one. -one. Risk is how long we expect someone might live with a disease. Our symptoms might be a very different sort of pattern. And we found that, that there, although there's a relationship, they clearly are not interchangeable. So there are individuals that have an MPN that might live for many, many years. They might live as long as they would have lived otherwise, but they clearly can have impact or suffer from their disease even though they're not living a shorter amount of time. So they are important complementary concepts. Now we have been able to identify that disease duration is important. These are not static diseases, they are dynamic. And many of you, and, and you know who you, you are, who are out there graphing your laboratory studies, some of them in color, some of them deriving the mathematical formula of change. You know, biology is never uh, quite that mathematical. So they can change, but they are clearly not linear. They can change unexpectedly. But duration of disease clearly has an impact on the symptom profile. Now, what about gender? So we did an analysis, and again, we clearly were able to demonstrate that there was a difference with women having higher levels of fatigue, more abdominal symptoms, microvascular symptoms, and total symptom scores. And this was culturally independent. So this is just as relevant whether I'm looking at Scandinavia or whether I'm looking at Sub-Saharan Africa. So again, very relevant. And there are many biological features for this that we need to be mindful of. Now, what do symptoms tell us about MPN biology? Is this solely that there are cytokine-driven symptoms, spleen and inflammation? There's even a concept now in medicine called the inflammasome, trying to estimate all aspects of inflammation in an individual. Or are there aspects in terms of mood disorders or anxiety over uncertainty? Or potentially, is there some of both? In terms of the biology, there clearly are a variety of increases in cytokines. You can think that these are like signals that are proteins that are circulating in the blood that can have a variety of impact, whether it's on symptoms, spleen, disease advancement, or even how an individual is doing. And many of the potential benefits of JAK inhibition may at least overlap with their impact in terms of these cytokines. Now, we've done a variety of studies just directly asking folks like yourself aspects of what do you think about your disease, what is important to you. We did this in parallel with physicians. And what we found is that there can be sometimes a little bit of a disconnect. With physicians, they are taught foremost managing diseases like ET and P. vera are around preventing blood clots at all costs. That's the aspirin, the hydrea, the anagrelai, the interferon. It's only about blood clots regardless of how you feel, regardless of everything else. Clearly, as we ask patients, avoiding progression of the disease is foremost on your minds. It's not to say anybody wants to have a blood clot. I think we clearly want to do both. But we need to be mindful of that important goal and how important it is to you. And this was true in patients with polycythemia vera. And it was also true in patients with myelofibrosis. Now, there was, a, there was uh, another patient, Zen Senyak, who he had this idea that we tested that said, you know, I think with my interaction with a lot of MPN patients that they have a lot of difficulties with anxiety. I do think some folks potentially have undiagnosed depression and it's not being adequately worked up and this could be a contributor. So we did a study and some of you may have participated in these surveys with 1800 MPN patients and identified using a variety of structured questionnaires, higher degrees of depression, anxiety, stress, and grief. And these clearly can contribute to the symptom profile. Now, again, this uncertainty 
I think is completely, it's relevant, it's reasonable, it's understandable, and we need to be just as mindful of it as if we're dealing with the white count or the plate account. Now, MPNs can have an impact on you in terms of employment. This we've recently published. Again, seeing the impact that can have an impact on duration of work. I really can't work eight hours a day. Uh, difficulties with fatigue, individuals choosing to leave work early, retire early, or other impact. Now, as we assess symptoms, the MPNs actually, I'm pleased to say, have really become a model across the rest of not only blood diseases, but of cancer in terms of using structured questionnaires to identify symptom improvement as part of a treatment pattern. Now, through all of these efforts, we identify that medicines help, but medicines frequently do not help 100%. I have many patients that are on an interferon, a hydrea, a ruxolitinib, an anagrolide, what have you, and many things are better, but they are not gone. They still have fatigue. That's probably the most common residual symptom, or there may be others. So our group has really tried to think outside of the box and say, are there other ways we might be able to help in addition to medicines? Not in necessarily in place of, but in addition. So we partnered with an online yoga company called Udaya to develop specific educational modules for MPN patients. So we sat down with them for about 12 hours, went through everything about the disease, the spleen, and they created special modules people could do at home. We identified that in this 12-week course, Patients were able to have decreases in anxiety, depression, sleep, and fatigue, and they feel that they could do this in a safe manner. We've recently completed accrual onto a randomized phase two between the at-home yoga and a wait list control with the people being able to cross over, where we not only look at the impact of yoga, but we look at the impact on the inflammatory cytokines and cortisol levels that can be drawn at home. And this is uh, set up for a large study for a future step for a randomized phase three study. We're looking at cognitive interventions. Again, this issue of anxiety and uncertainty. There is acceptance and commitment therapy. This is a type of therapy that looks at a variety of modules for discussing how do I wrap my head around this, this difficulty that I have, that I have to live with for the time being. This sort of intervention has been helpful in both chronic conditions as well as in cancers. And we are piloting both in feasibility a, the face-to-face -face intervention and the developing online modules that will be able to be utilized for patients. This is an ongoing uh, developmental study as well. And then finally, there is the issue of anti-inflammatory diets. So again, there's probably 100 of these diets out there, but we know inflammation is a key issue. We know there's hardly a patient I see that doesn't ask, should I be eating something different? And really nobody can answer you with any straight answer because no one has tested anything. So we have been working with a variety of both scientists, nutritionists, people who study inflammation to try to develop an initial interventional uh, dietary uh, intervention for patients with MPNs called the Nutrient Study. We're, we currently conducted some focus groups this past week. We've done a variety of surveys. And again, trying to get to a point, one, if we develop an intervention, which one should it be? Is it something that people can understand? Is it something people can actually follow? Does it actually have an impact in terms of how people feel? And does it actually have an impact on the inflammatory markers that we want to study? So we're trying to bring some real science to other things that we can try in parallel with medicines. So trying to put it all together, trying to manage a long-term illness like an MPN is several parts. One you're doing here today, knowledge. Trying to learn more about your disease and be empowered. Two, your sense of community. Very powerful. Three, clearly appropriate medical care. And as you see, there are many nuances to that care. And finally, I think the rest of an individual's health. So I look at many of those other aspects of non-pharmacologic interventions, Again, I could say that we could plug anyone who doesn't have a disease and have them be exercising, eating better, and likely their health is going to be better. So I'll leave you with a, a bit of a poem. I like to have patients share with me a little bit of their gifts 
when, uh, when we have a chance to visit. And this was a P. Vera patient who wrote this for me to, to share. It's called The Itch. I have an itch you cannot know, not the least hint will ever show. No bump, no rash, no insect bite provides a clue as to my plight. My clothes, a shower, the air I breathe makes my skin prickle and seethe. Constant reminders it provides of the disease my body hides. Maddening tears the burning brings. No scratch, no pills can stop the stings. Life is good. It could be much worse. I can live with my itchy curse. I walk the dog to pass the time, take deep breaths and clear my mind. Paritis is a small price for my wonderful blessed life. Thank you. <laughs>